Death, Sex, and Money is supported by Spotify. There's always something new to discover on Spotify, including the world's most popular podcast today. Just open the app, tap Browse, and dive into their growing library. Podcasts on Spotify are streaming right now, including Death, Sex, and Money. Go check it out. I heard a voice as audible as my own say, Nisi, don't be a selfish heifer. It's other people... (laughs) Now, that's what the voice said to me. Don't judge my voice. (laughs) This is Death, Sex, and Money. I'm Anna Sale. And I am really glad to be here with you tonight in Los Angeles as part of this festival that's celebrating what women podcasters are making, the Work It Festival. It's really an honor to be here in this incredibly beautiful theater. I hope you got to see it before the lights went down. Our show is about the things we think about a lot and need to talk about more. And tonight we're talking about a life phase where there's a lot to think about and a lot to talk about our 20s. When I think about my 20s, what I remember is feeling like I was had this clear track in front of me that immediately came to an abrupt end when school ended. And everything that had felt somewhat familiar fell away. And I had to learn how to support myself. I had to think about whether I needed more schooling to keep supporting myself into my career. But really one of the things I thought the most about was sex and whether I knew how to do it, and whether I was doing it enough, and whether people wanted to have sex with me, and then finally realizing I got to think about whether I wanted to have sex with them. But there's a lot that goes into that phase of life, and we asked Death, Sex, and Money listeners over the last couple of months, if they were in their 20s, what questions they had in their lives as they were beginning adulthood. And y'all had a lot of questions. So um, we're gonna do some life advice at the end of this show with my incredible guests who are here tonight. I am so stoked with these women that are here. Terry Coleman is here. We first met her in our New Orleans series. She was on the show, and she flew all the way from New Orleans, Louisiana, to be here tonight to tell a story on stage, guys. Also here is Nisi Nash. Okay. Nisi. Love Nisi. I love her in Reno 911. I loved her in Getting On. I love her in Claws. But we're going to talk about the phase in her life when she was beginning her acting career in her 20s and also having three kids. Nisi got it done in her 20s. <laughs> but my first guest was already famous by the time she hit 20. Now you see her on Search Party, on TBS. You've seen her in the latest season of Transparent. But when she was 14, she got cast as Maybe on Arrested Development. <laughs> Please welcome Alia Shawkat. Hi. That's my radio voice. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So my first question for you is whether... I'm just (laughs) figuring out my physicality. Get comfy. Yeah. Did starting working as a kid make you feel like you were going through what you noticed your peers go through in your 20s at an earlier stage or a later stage? Did it make me notice what they were going through? Or did you feel like you were going through the things that come with your 20s when you were 15, 16? Um, I definitely feel like I had a little bit of an early view on some things. Um, Watching, you know, the way certain adults act um, under pressure or just when they're uncomfortable. Um, being a kid, you know, with Michael Sarah going to like Fox parties, drinking cranberry juice, and <laughs> strange people coming up to us, and we were really like invisible at those parties. Nobody was watching the show, uh, so we just like <laughs> got into these weird parties and we're like hanging out at like Hollywood parties that now I've lost interest in, even though I still go. But um, <laughs> but yeah, I definitely had a different view. I mean. Also, being a young professional, I guess you could call it, uh, people are speaking to you. With the, you know, you have a lot of responsibility, but you're still a kid. So it's a strange thing because you kind of have to play the kid and also do your job. Um, and the, your parents are all of a sudden not in a powerful role. 
they're like, sit it, you know, and if anything, they have the least powerful role. They're like, right, you're the set mom. Uh, can you go away? Huh. You know, and, it, and it's kind of weird, but I always gave respect to my parents. I was like, no, you sit in this chair. But then there'd be other kid actors I'd see, and they'd be like, get the hell out of my chair, mom. You know, it's uh, so it was a strange, like, kind of dichotomy for being like a kid, but feeling like I had more power than I had access to at the time, if that makes sense. Hmm. And you didn't get some of the money that you were earning as a kid until you became 18, right? Yeah. So didn't when get that you money. got this money that you'd been earning for mm-hmm. years, did you know what to do with it? No. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> still don't. Um, yeah, it was strange. You know, I came up in a family that always had, like, provided for me very well. Um, you know, they weren't extremely wealthy, but, like, we were, like, well-to-do. So I never while I was shooting or working or I was always able to, you know, have things. There was never really a struggle in that world. But then when I turned 18, uh, I went to Sarah Lawrence College for literally two days. <laughs> and uh, it's a very expensive <laughs> private school, wonderful school, so I've heard. Uh, I, I went there. Did and, you pay for the two days? And So it's a very expensive uh, <laughs> tuition, but, yeah. which I found out after I got all the money back. I was like, that's how much I was spending on it? <laughs> Um, but it was my own money. But yeah, there was always, um, you know, and what I realize now, looking back on a lot of things, it was that it was my choice not to ask because I was like 18 and always had what I wanted, but then all of a sudden I was really pulling from my actual account. And my dad was always like, you can't be spending your money like this. And he's foreign. Um, <laughs> that's where that, <laughs> that vague accent comes from. Um, but yeah, I didn't know what to do. So like I got to school, I w- wanted to be working at the same time and kind of thought I was like Natalie Portman with like Star Wars on the back burner, but really I was like an unknown actress who had like an indie film on the back burner. And I was like, so, you know, I have to go to Florida to shoot this like low budget movie. And they were like, if you miss more than two classes, like you're done, like you can't, you have to commit to being in school. And so I kind of just had to decide right there, like very quickly, I was like, I'm not gonna be here then. I have to go do what I'm doing. And so my friend picked me up, I moved to the city. And then I was like, you know, spending $600 on like a fancy dress and then counting quarters to have like Thai food at night. And I was like, I really, I know, sad, right? (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I feel like there's much worse stories. But um, I was like, you know, had a place in the West Village, a studio. I just didn't know what it meant, like what to invest or where I wanted to put my money, what would actually be helpful and come back or what I wanted to invest in just emotionally and actually financially. So... It was a very strange time, and then I wasn't working. I kind of stopped working because I was feeling bitter about uh, being some kind of ingenue. I didn't feel like I was, and, and all these things. So I wasn't working, so I wasn't making money, but I was spending it like crazy. And um, it really got to the point where it just, you know, and my dad, looking back on it, was always like, let's go over your money, and I could tell you how to do it. And I was like, da 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 I don't want to hear that, you know? Um, I was very scared of it. And it's taken a while, but like to me slowly, you know, things have been good, I've been working now, but it's almost like the more I took focus on creatively what I wanted to do, the more I was like, right, and then what does that mean? What do I actually get paid for? Instead of just following some like instinct, like I don't want to see it, like blinders. I definitely had blinders on when I was young. I want to talk a little bit more about talking with, about money with your dad and about your yeah. parents' business. Mm-hmm. So growing up, did you know what kind of business your parents were running? Yes. And I was aware. Uh, Aren't you guys excited to find out what it was? <laughs> <laughs> Let's do the big reveal. When was the first time that you went inside the business your folks were running? Um, yes, yeah, so my parents um, um a gentleman's nightclub called Showgirls in Cathedral City. Go check it out. Uh, drop my name. <laughs> You'll get VIP. <laughs> it's a great business. Um, yeah, my, my parents ran it together. They opened it together. And... Um, you know, it was always treated, it was never secretive. Uh, my father was always home in time for dinner. You know, sometimes he'd get like angry phone calls, you know, at dinner time being like, you tell them, blah, 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 you know, because it's like a nightclub. So there's a lot of fights and, you know, intense conversations that were happening over at the nightclub uh, while we were having dinner. But we had a very, like, my parents are very conservative yet open, but like, you know, kind of like buttoned up people. Um, so there was never any kind of like weird wash. Like um, it, it was very funny when people would talk about, it, especially when I was young. As I got like a little older, like meaning 12, 13, and boys in school would be like, "Your parents own a strip club. Like, can we get in?" And I was like, 
yeah. <laughs> um, I was like, no, you're underage, obviously. But um, <laughs> it, it was a strange thing where I noticed how, like, because in, in my family, it never really affected us, even though, like, in my dad's car, he would have these magazines, and it was, like, products to buy for the club. And they're, like, you know, kind of sex magazines, um, sex toys or things like that, or, you know, bar stools, like, for nightclubs. And we would, me and my brother, like, found it, and it wasn't like, oh, you found dad's porn. It was like, oh, just put that down. What are you doing? That's dad's business stuff. Like, we just, and, like, leave it on the counter. Like, it was nothing ever, like, hush-hush or secretive. Um, and my dad's office was, like, separate from the place, and it just always was, like, the family business. But then, naturally, over time, um, I only went in there once when I was, like, very young, like 10 or something, there was a fire. Oh. And so I got to go in, and I remember there being like a lizard. <laughs> there was a fire, so you there got was a to fire. go into yeah, They were like, go now, now, now. I was like, it's still going, the fire. Uh, no, the fire stopped. Yeah, very like, my dad was like, very strict about rules. Like, I didn't actually go in as a customer until I was 21. Um, mm-hmm. And my dad, like, he wasn't against it, but he was just like, well, I was like, why? And I was like, I don't know, it's paid for my private schooling and dinner ever since I was a child, and it's, your, like, livelihood, our livelihood, like, I'm curious. So he was, like, a little nervous, but wasn't, like, telling me not to go. It was just a little, like, okay. He, like, wanted to make sure to go with me. And I went with my friend, you know, who's a gay guy, who's a, both of our interests were a little off. But uh, (laughs) we went in, we ended up playing pool most of the time. And then I sat down with him, and he was talking to me about, like, you know, acting, asking me about my schedule. I was like, yeah, I have to go to New York next week, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, right, right, so you leave on Friday. And then this girl came up, and she couldn't have been older than me. She must have been younger. Um, and she, you know, was in a bikini, and she was asking my dad, um, you know, a question also about scheduling, but, like, about her own schedule, like, when she's working and stuff. And my dad, kind of in the same breath, was like, so you go to New York on Friday? No, you work on Friday, so you blah, 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 make sure you be here, okay. So when do you get back, you know, to me? And I was just like, something's happening. Um, and I felt very strange about it. Um, there wasn't like anything negative about it, but I was just like, it kind of all hit me at once, but I was just like, wow, this obviously has affected the way I view my sexuality all my life. And, <laughs> and you know, me and my dad had troubles when I was in high school because of like, I smoked pot and that was like heroin to him. Um, so we had our own time, but then we, you know, became close, but there was always, you know, he's a Middle Eastern man and he's an amazing father and runs a great business, but I mean, well, he's like very respectful to everyone, but it was always something that kind of stood in the middle of us, like, uh, you know, sexuality as a woman. I'm the only daughter, and, you know, he doesn't want me to... It's not something we could talk about openly. I never would tell him when I was dating someone, or if I had, like, I'm having a problem with somebody, you know, or the fact that I was, like, attracted to women as well as men. Like, these things were just, like, never talked about with him. And now that I've gotten older, I'm like, it almost seemed just like, ah, it's easier not to talk about it. We have a nice time when we, you know, have a barbecue. We just enjoy things together. There's no need to really get into stuff. But now it's necessary for me to feel complete and, you know what I mean? Honest. And honest, yeah, exactly. Uh, well, it took I, me a long time to say that word, huh? <laughs> um, but yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. And as far as, like, when I think of my 20s, it, like, mm-hmm. figuring out my belonging was something and I'm still thinking about a lot, but in particular, it felt very urgent in my 20s. And I'm curious, like, growing up with an Iraqi-American dad in Southern California, mm-hmm. did you feel white growing up? You know, I, it's, it's so funny to be talking about this now, because like, in a strange way, a lot of things that happen when you're younger, you don't really realize it until at least a handful of years have passed by, and you're like, oh, wow, that was strange. Um, in school, I was, like, the most ethnic one. Even when kids would try to, like say mean things and stuff, they would say slangs, like um, terrible like Arab slangs and stuff. And uh, so I always, in my hair, and like, you know, I had freckles, but I was just like, I always was too ethnic. And even when I, and then when I started acting, um, the first interaction I had with acting was my mom, we got headshots taken and sent them to LA, and no one responded for a long time or called me in for auditions. And my mom called and was like, so what's the deal? I just want to make sure you're receiving them. And they said, she's too ethnic for any of the roles. Um, we don't really have a placement for her. And then it took me going to LA to audition, and they're like, she can act. So it, that's what was my first thing. Like, my mom had to tell me, like, this is why you haven't been getting called on stuff. And I was like, I'm too ethnic, okay. And then also on the other end, by being like, but then I'm not ethnic enough. You know what I mean? I don't necessarily have, like, it's not clear what group I, like, fit in. People are just like, you look weird, you know? Um, 
so it was it was like me kind of finding it, and then in that, you know, it's, it's luckily I've found confidence in my own like unique kind of beauty, which is being celebrated more now, which is great. So we're gonna have you back again at the end of the show. Yes. But I, you are our only guest who is actually in her 20s. Oh, there you go. So I want to ask you, <laughs> thinking about your life now and what, what are the sort of big questions that you're struggling with, like, mm -hmm. what do you hope in 10 years you, you are not struggling with anymore? Mm. Great question. Um, I hope I'm not changing um, to make other people comfortable. Um, I think there's something healthy about we're all different around different people in our lives, like our family, our lovers, our friends, people at work. And I think that's good to have different sides of our, our personality. And, and, you know, there's something great about that. People bring out different qualities. But I don't want it to feel like I'm, like, searching for the mask. Like, all right, this one. Okay, hey, here I am. This is the one you wanted, you know. And I felt that a lot in my 20s. Like, I mean, I'm still in them. Um, but so I'm feeling it now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but when you're younger, that just seems like everything. It's like, who am I going to present tonight? Or like making people happy, you know, especially with lovers. It was always like, whatever you want to like keep this night going. And it always seemed fun. And then the next day it was kind of like an emotional hangover from it. I was like, who was I last night? I guess we'll find out, you know, because um, I would film everything. Um, <laughs> no, I didn't. But... Um, but yeah, that's, that's really what I, you know, and I'm working on it every day, you know, a little bit more, just trying to be like, don't like break into it. Like, it's okay. Just like say how you feel. That's part of you. People, you'll actually get closer to this person by just being that version of yourself, like the real one. So yeah. Alia Shawkat, everyone. Hey. Thank you. I'll see you guys later. We'll see her again at the end of the show. Our next guest, Terry Coleman, I met when we went to New Orleans to do some reporting about the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. And we didn't forget her. Uh, she's 31 years old. She teaches English at Dillard University. She's also a leader, a coordinator nationally on the National Collegiate Quiz Bowl circuit. In fact, one of her latest tattoos is an homage to the role of trivia in her life. On her left butt cheek, it just says, nasty nerd. Please welcome to the stage, Terry Coleman, along with Bianca Richardson. There are so many of you. Oh my gosh. Um, well, I feel like this is a, uh, a good chance to give a shout out to my tattoo artist, Katie B. If you're ever in New Orleans, she's at Downtown Tattoos on Frenchman. She's awesome. You should go see her. So people learn lots of things in their 20s. And I learned a really important lesson in my early 20s. Um, I learned this lesson from someone who is near and dear to my heart. I have an intimate and somewhat fraught relationship with him. A few of you might know him. His name is Jose fucking Cuervo. Um, so this is 2006, 2007. New Orleans is still mostly a ghost town. Like, nobody's had time to come home yet. And there's people around, but none of them are, like, my people. So, like, my parents are in Lafayette. One of my brothers is in Atlanta. One's in Texas. My, the kids I went to school with, they're in, like, Chicago, California. Matt's in Brazil. My aunties, uncles, godparents. Like, everybody's just gone. And it's the first time in my whole life that I haven't had eyes on me when there's nobody to, like snitch and I lost my goddamn mind like it was the first time in my life that I could just like be my full trash self in public and so I was my full trash self in public a lot and I was working at this little like pizza joint in the quarter and um, I was living with a lot of the people I worked with like you do in your 20s and one night, we had gotten off work, and we were all, like, bitching about our customers having some shift drinks, and we decided to turn this into a full-blown after-party. So we ended up deciding to go to this bar. But before we left the restaurant, like, I was already fucked up. Like, I was already, like, slurring and, like, messy, and, like, I probably should have walked my little happy ass home, but I didn't. 
because Trash Terry was nothing if not a survivor, and she soldiered on through this. Uh, we ended up at this little place, Cosmos. It's like a little like, hole in the wall joint in the lower quarter. And um, Olivia, who I live with and works with, she goes up to the bar and she orders a round of shots, a round of Jose Cuervo. And that was like pretty much the night. I don't remember anything that happened at the bar. Like we probably had fun. Maybe somebody saw a boob. But like all I really remember is almost like a movie montage in my head where there's this bar and there's this little plastic shot glass because it's the kind of place where the shots come in plastic. And there's this clear liquid and my hand goes to the liquid and my hand brings the cup and the liquid up to my face hole. And like I remember this feeling again and again where I closed my eyes and put my head back and like willed my throat to open and like force myself to swallow again and again and again and again and again and again. And like gone. So at some point we ended up at home. I have no idea how we got there. And we had this one roommate, Nettie, who was like super responsible. Like she had a job that she went to in the morning time, in the AM. And she had her bed on a bed frame, not a mattress on the floor. But I remember her making me drink water and getting me undressed, putting me in bed, kissing my forehead. And then I blacked out. There's nothing left. And then I wake up, puking. If you try to swallow even the tiniest amount of your own vomit, it will magically transform through the magic of science into more vomit. And like, I'm laying there on my back for, like it had to be hours. Like my alarm goes off, the radio comes on, like I know all about the traffic and the weather and like Steve Inskeep is talking, we're going all the way through morning edition. And I survived, but I kept on like going back to this night and thinking about it because this night wasn't unique. Like it was the only night where I tried to swallow my own vomit, but it wasn't the only night where after a series of unfortunate events, Trash Terry ended up in a situation which was not ideal. And I was like looking back at this night, trying to do an autopsy of it, trying to like figure out like, at what point did I fuck up? Like, why am I making these horrible choices? And like, what I realized as I kept going through this night was that I actually wasn't making bad choices. I just wasn't making any choices at all. And like, I didn't know why I did that. And the more I thought about it, the more I tried to go over this night and figure out like, how did we get here? How did we get here? How did we get here? I realized that I'd been doing the same thing since childhood. Like I had always done this. So when I was in lower school from kindergarten to fifth grade, I went to this super ritzy all girls private Catholic school in New Orleans. And we're trying to figure out which American girl to be. You know that um, the book series, the historical fiction slash the like line of terrifying dolls. Um, and all the little white girls, they're like, hmm, I don't know who I'll choose. Like, maybe I'll be Felicity because I love George Washington. And like, you know, maybe I'll be Samantha because I love velvet dresses and writing. And it became really clear really early on that I wasn't going to have a choice. There's only one black American girl. There's Addie. And so I didn't have a choice because Addie is the token and Terry is the token and there are no other options. But I really didn't want to be Addie. I was just like the rest of them. I had read all of the books. Like, I liked Kirsten. I like braids. I like Scandinavia. Like, I also <laughs> it participated in these stories. Like, I'm in my 30s now. It's been 20 years since I've read the Addie book, and I still remember that book. I still remember what it felt like reading it. In the book, Addie's dad and her brother get sold away. And the next day, she still has to go work in the fields. Because when you're a slave, you don't get like bereavement time. And she's distracted, understandably. And she's going down the row and she's picking the tobacco grubs off the leaves. But she only gets the top because she's distracted. She leaves all the bugs underneath. And the overseer sees this. And he comes up the row behind her and he collects all of these grubs. At the end of the row, he stops her and he makes her eat them. And 
When I was reading that book, I remember feeling these grubs in my mouth. I remember feeling them squirm. And so there, back in the classroom, these little girls, they weren't monsters. They didn't know what they were doing. They weren't doing anything on purpose to me. But what it felt like was that they were saying, Terry, the only choice you have is to eat the worms again. And I couldn't do it. All I did instead was, I knew that I could make one choice. I could make some white girls cry and maybe pop them in their mouth. And I got in trouble. I should have gotten in trouble. I hurt someone. And that's what I learned again and again and again throughout my childhood, that if I chose for myself, if I chose what I wanted and what I needed, if I chose not to eat the fucking worms, I was a problem and I got in trouble. I learned never to choose for me. So when you fast forward to your early 20s, when there's no one around to like curate your experiences, if you don't choose good things for yourself, you end up laying on your back trying to swallow your own vomit. This realization that like, oh fuck, Terry, you're not making bad choices, you're not making choices, it was, it changed everything. And it wasn't immediate, I had to practice. And like it was solidly like post-Cuervo catastrophe that I was trying to choose which birth control to use, and I took too long, and I went through a whole ass pregnancy and have a whole ass like living, breathing child because of this. But I got better at it. <laughs> I learned how to look at my options and make decisions based on what doors I wanted to leave open for myself, what sacrifices I was willing to make, what doors I was willing to close. So in 2011, when I found out I was pregnant again, I was still in school, I was like, well, I can look at my choices this time. I don't want to give up school. I don't want to give up the life that I want to make for myself and for my family. And so I had an abortion and got rid of it. Then, after I finished undergrad, um, I moved my entire family across the country to Charleston, Illinois. And about two months after we got there, I realized my Nuva ring had punked me and I was pregnant again. That time, I did the same thing. I looked at my choices, the options I had, what doors I was willing to close, and what doors I wanted to leave open, and I decided to keep it. I have three kids now, and raising children is not like a fun thing. Like, I spend a lot of time like breaking up fights about things I do not care about and like wiping other human beings' butts. But when I'm doing that, this recognition that I chose them, that I decided to give up things in order to have things, and they are one of the things, the experiences, the pieces of my life that I wanted, it lets me be happy. I think a lot of times when people have stories like mine, they're really easy to TLDR into this neat little box where, you know, it's like, there go I, but for the grace of God, you know, the story of like redemption. But for me, it's really not at all one of those neat little stories, and God does not have a lot to do with it. Um, instead, it's weird to say out loud, but when I think about it, if not for the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jose Cuervo, I wouldn't be here at all. That's Terry Coleman. and LA's own Bianca Richardson. Coming up, our guests answer your 20-something life advice questions, and Nisi Nash talks about how she got her first big gig on the show Reno 911. I lied my way into that Reno audition. <laughs> Leading up to this show, we asked those of you who are in your 20s to send us your life advice questions. And we got a lot of them, a lot more that we could answer in this one show. So we started a spreadsheet at deathsexmoney.org slash 20s advice for you to ask more questions and to help each other out. That's at deathsexmoney.org slash 20s advice. There's also a link on our Facebook page. We already entered in some of the questions you emailed us, like what financial advice would you give your 20-something self? Or when do you know you're drinking too much? If you've got advice to give, jump in. This is a space for you all to talk with each other. Again, that's at deathsexmoney.org slash 20s advice.
Death, Sex, and Money is supported by Spotify. There's always something new to discover on Spotify. And with a mix of originals and many of the world's most popular podcasts, listening to shows on Spotify is easy. Just open the app, tap browse, and dive into their growing library. Subscribe to your favorites, including our entire archive, so you'll never miss a show. You can also download podcasts for those moments when you're up in the air or going underground. Podcasts on Spotify are streaming right now. Go check them out. This is Death, Sex, and Money from WNYC. I'm Anna Sale, and this is our live show from Los Angeles. I loved talking to our next guest, actor Nisi Nash, and I wish you could see the outfit she wore on stage. There are pictures at deathsexmoney.org. She wore this black and white striped button-down shirt belted at the waist with thigh-high blue suede boots. Hi, Nisi. Hi, hi everybody. <laughs> Doing my best to keep these thighs in. Okay. <laughs> mm. So, Nisi, we are talking about our 20s on oh, the show tonight. You have some kids in their 20s now. Two of your three kids are you in their 20s. You just going to start right there, huh? <laughs> All right, let's go for it. I'm in. Let's do what it. What do you want to know? Let's do it. I want to know how, like, you look at their lives now and how you think about what was happening in your life in your early 20s. What's different for them? When I look at my children, I think that they have it easy. Mm -hmm. Hmm? (laughs) Very easy because when I was in my 20s, I was already married with children. So the fact that you can... Listen, if they were any more dependent on me, we'd all have the same Social Security number. (laughs) Okay? So when I was in my 20s... I was on my own with a husband, with babies trying to figure it out. So we have a very, it's, it's very, very different. Yeah, you know, and my, and my kids are all single. None of them have children, you know, and everything they have is tied to my credit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's real, it's real different. I was good and grown when I was in my 20s. Well, let's talk about that. So you're, you're 22 when you have your first child? 21. 21. And you were studying theater. You're, you know you want to be an actor at that point. Did you think, like, you were going to have to choose? Or how did, you, how did it work when, you have, when all of a sudden you have an infant and you also know you want to start a career in Hollywood? How did you think about it at that time? Well, uh, my plan A was to be an actor. My plan B was to make that plan A work. <laughs> so... There were three words that I began to live by, no matter what. Mm. So my no matter what of it all uh, meant push through whatever the obstacle or whatever it is you have to face, you make it happen no matter what. I I used to have like horrible arguments with my ex-husband and always before an audition. And I entered into the business being funny. So I would cry all the way, you know, from where I was living in the ghetto, up here to one of these fancy studios, <laughs> the whole way. Yeah. I would get there, I would clean that makeup up, pat that thing down, push them shoulders back, and sashay on in there. Mm. Um, you know, or if I got a call back at 4 o'clock and all the kids got out at 3, what did I have to do? Pack them all up take them to the casting office, put them in the corner, get the baba. Where's the baba? Find the baba. You get a coloring book. Sit down. Where's the graham crackers? You know, you you understand what I'm saying? (laughs) And make the corner of the casting office into a preschool. Yeah. (laughs) No matter what. That's amazing. I love that. Thank you. Something that also happened in your 20s is you lost your brother to gun violence. Mm-hmm. Someone brought a gun to school and he was shot and killed at school. Mm-hmm. He was a teenager. Yeah, 17. And you were a new mother. Mm-hmm. You're trying to start an acting career. How did you fit or have you fit in mourning your brother when so much is happening in your life and you're already responsible to other people? 
Well, see, there used to be a time in my life where because there were so many tragedies, prior to my brother being killed, I saw my mother get shot by her boyfriend. Mm. Um, you, as close to me as I am to you. And she survived that, but it was very traumatic. You know, it was a very traumatic event. Yeah. And so, I, you know, and harrying up and trying to marry a man thinking he was going to fix it all. You know, I wanted him on the white horse and to ride in and to make it all better. And I went from the frying pan to the fire in that situation. And so what I, what I started to do was I just decided to not feel. I'm like, that's got to be easier than this nonsense. So I was like, oh, I'm just not going to feel that. And so everything was a joke and everything was fun and funny. And, and he would come home and be like, um, hey, we need to talk. And my response would be, we need to talk. We need to talk. Hey, we need to talk. Hey. You know, and he's like, oh, my God, will you knock it off already? Um, and, and then I, so I wasn't managing my emotions well. Um, and then at one point, I just got sick of myself. When? Uh, well, well, it had gone on for a while of the not managing. Yeah. Uh, not managing the emotions well. It was like a, just a dark cloud over me. You know what I mean? Because to wear the mask of, of everything is good and, you know, you know, the tears of a clown. You know what I mean? You, you just jumping around all day. It's, it's exhausting running from yourself, you know? And I just had to say enough is enough, you know? And it's, and it's time to do something different because I've mastered this. And I know where this leads. And then I decided to do something else. But the one thing that I will tell you is that it, the, the adage is true, is that out of your mess, th there's this beautiful message, there's this epiphany, there's this other thing that happens on the other side of it. And I remember when my brother was shot, I took a backstage to my grief because my mother, it's, it's out of order to lose a child. So I'm looking at my mother going, my God. What, what do we do here? And the only thing I knew was that I could make my mama laugh. So when, when after my mother had been shot, gone through a terrible divorce, then my brother was killed, I, she said, I'm getting in the bed and I'm never getting back out. And I said, well, what, am I, what do I do? So in my 20s, I stood at the front of my mother's bed every day and told her jokes, stories, did my bid, tap danced, hula hooped. Uh, there was a myriad of skills <laughs> that, that I developed at the foot of my mother's bed. So one day I go in there and she's not in the bed. And I'm like, you know, where's my mother? We're in here. I'm like, who's we? I went across the street and got the neighbors, Miss Brown and Miss Sadie. I told them you was funny. Get that karaoke microphone and tell these people some jokes. <laughs> I'm telling the people the jokes and I realized because I wanted to be a very, I wanted to just do drama. That yeah. was what I wanted to do. I wanted them to do a remake, you know, of Roots part six or seven and <laughs> I get to be the lead slave. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was preparing for that in my mind and then that did not happen. And, and I was standing up there telling my mother and her neighbors these jokes and I heard a voice as audible as my own say, Nisi, don't be a selfish heifer. It's other people. <laughs> now that's what the voice said to me. Don't judge my voice. <laughs> Don't judge my internal voice, okay? <laughs> My voice say to me, don't be a selfish heifer. It's other people suffering. Go outside and spread it around. So I went outside because I couldn't book a job anywhere in this town. I went outside and said, I'm Nisi Nash and I'm funny. And they said, yes, you are, little girl. Come here. Hmm. And that's, you know, that's what came on the other side of all of that. So about how old were you when you had that feeling of only making people laugh, running from your feelings, performing, when that ran out? When, when I stopped feeling like that? Yeah. Uh, that was probably in my late 20s, you know, knocking on the door at 30, when I was like, oh my goodness, I, I got to do something different. And how did you learn how to do something different? You know what? I spent a lot of time in church. And it was there that um, my prayer life became so rich. Um, and it's hard to stand in a place of being um, available to be used and have so much over, overtaking you. 
And that was always my thing. I've never been on the set and not gotten somebody else a job. I just feel like, well, who does that? I mean, I don't know. I guess people do it, but I don't. Because I don't feel like when I get anything that it's just for me. Do you understand what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Like, I'm so grateful that I get to live my dream because there are so many people who do not that when I stand flat-footed in a blessing that was customized for me, my first question is, how can I be used? You know, I... Thank you. Um, <laughs> we got two or three that want to be used. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, <laughs> but uh, that's okay. The people that didn't clap, they selfish. <laughs> they selfish. They for self. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but <laughs> so anyway, when I, because I really want to serve in the gift, you, you, you have to be a prepared place for that. Did you have someone in the business who you went to for advice? Um, no. Well, not really. What happened was, true story, um, I went to this audition, and, you know, this was back in the day when you used to walk in with a full 8 by 10 and then you had your resume stapled to the back. And my resume had maybe six things on it, but they were all very foolish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Miss South Bay, second winner up grand talent. <laughs> that was right at the top. Uh, <laughs> lead usher um, at the <laughs> Tabernacle of Faith Bible Fellowship play. Um, <laughs> And there was a guy who is now a very big deal over at Lifetime, but then he was a casting assistant. Um, my good friend, Jason Wood, he's now, I mean, he's still my friend, but I didn't know him from a can of paint. And he looked at, he was receiving the, the pictures, and he looked at the back of mine and he just said, girlfriend, psst, come here. This is all wrong, dear. And he just started to oh. go through it with a red pen. And when he got through, there was only one thing left. And I said, dang. You scratched all my stuff out. Now I only got one thing on there. He looked back and said, but darling, it's the right thing. Mm. And I said, well, excuse me. And I loved him in that moment. I and I still love him now. So he, he was the one that I would go to and be like, hey, here's the situation. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And he's still my really dear friend. I but I didn't know anybody in entertainment. You know, I'm from South Central, and I had never heard of Groundlings, Second City. I didn't know what improv was when I auditioned for Reno. I lied my way into that Reno audition. <laughs> <laughs> facts. Hashtag facts. Um, they were auditioning, and they called and said, originally, can you do sketch? And I said, Psh, yes. <laughs> And I hung up the phone and I called my friend Big George and said, what the hell is sketch? I didn't even know what it was. And he was like, oh, you got to do characters and stuff. And I was like, okay, I could do that. But when I got there, there were two girls there who I now know were huge in the improv world. But at the time, I didn't know. So I'm not going to name names. <laughs> so one of them was doing vocal warm-ups. You know, mama, pop, pop, all this stuff. And I was like, ooh. And then the other girl was on the other side stretching for the gods, leg here, pow! <laughs> I was sitting down reading the magazine. <laughs> I stood up, I was like, I could give you a good lunch. Is this anything? But the one thing that I, I feel like worked for me in this business is that I was always comfortable in my skin, always. And I remember knocking on the door, and there were maybe 15 people in there, and I said, excuse me, are y'all about to get this dog and pony show started? Now, I don't have nothing on my resume. These people don't know me from a can of paint. I don't even know how I got in there, right? And then, and, the, and then one person in the room said, well, why? Are you in a hurry? And I said, ma'am, as a matter of fact, I am. I got to get my kids to Chuck E. Cheese by 7 o'clock. <laughs> Because the last time I was late, they jumped on the mouse, the head came off, the man ran in the back and never came back out. So yeah, I'm in a hurry. 
so they let me audition. So I do the audition. I don't know no better, and that's it, and I leave. They say, uh, Rena, uh, the, they want to give you a call back. And I'm like, say what? <laughs> so I have my mother watching my kids so I'm not distracted, but I don't even know enough. This is one thing about being young. You don't know what you don't know, so you don't have fear. Your fear is learned. Yes. You, you learn how to be fearful when you're older. Like, oh my God, are they going to, maybe I shouldn't, but if I go and I don't know what they're going to, I didn't know any better. I, matter of fact, when I went back to the callback, first thing they said when I walked in, um, I was like, hello, everyone, I'm, I'm ready, and you know, got myself together. What happened at Chuck E. Cheese? <laughs> I'm like, girl, it was a good time. <laughs> well, in the spirit of passing it on, yeah. we're going to give some advice to Death, oh, Sex, and we? Money listeners. Advice. Advice. So oh, you okay. stay put. I'm going to invite back Alia Shawkat and Terry Coleman. Please come out on stage. <laughs> Okay, Nisi's already dropped some serious knowledge. So, oh, yeah, I've learned a lot. So we've, yeah, we're, we've, we're well into the advice segment. Um, so we asked our listeners, our debt, mm -hmm. sex, and money listeners, in their 20s, if they had life questions about starting out adulthood. And we got a lot of questions. Here's just a sampling. Does hard work really pay off? Is this what work-life balance means? How do you make a long-distance family relationship work for everyone? Can the girl propose to the guy, or is that still kind of weird? How do I decorate my home like an adult? Does it get any easier? Is it normal to feel this way? Any advice, tips, anything. I need it. She needs it. <laughs> so let's start with our first question. This is a video. Hi, I'm Samaya. I'm 22 years old, and I live in New York City. And I was wondering how to deal with friends who make a lot more money than you and have a different relationship to money. I definitely have a lot of friends who ask me to go out on these expensive things and, you know, don't get that one, it's my whole weekend budget, and two, it's like pretty uncomfortable to keep feeling like I have to spend a lot of money to hang out with people. And it kind of feels like they're flashing their money around and I don't know how to talk to them about that. Okay, Ali, I'm throwing this one to you first. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with money differentials and friendships? Yeah, I definitely went through that. Um, I had a lot of friends who were um, like some other actors and money was like no question to them. And yeah, we'd be in these crowds and I was like, yeah, me too, splits. Um, <laughs> and it was very uncomfortable. Um, you know, the advice I would give is like, suggest your own night out. And don't be like embarrassed about being like, dude, that's too expensive. I don't have the money. I don't want to go there. But you know what? There is this really cool spot that I discovered and it's like really good and it's actually cheap. And then there's a cool bar around the corner that has, you know, whatever, something that fits in yours. Because I think every friendship, it shouldn't depend on how much you, you know, money you make. Otherwise, cut those friends out as soon as possible. But um, it also just like we, there should be a balance of what you guys do together. So it should be a mix of both. And just suggest other things. And, and I don't think there's any shame in being like, I can't afford that right now, but this is fun. So let's do this instead. Terry, Nisi, anything to add? Yeah, so as the not famous person, like she said this in the past <laughs> tense, like, oh, I remember that. <laughs> That's my life. I still have that part. <laughs> um, and so I do very much agree with that. Like, it's really important to like, not have shame in that. But um, so, like, I also went to, I grew up always going to school with rich kids. Like I was the only, one of the only kids at my school whose mom worked. And I kind of have leaned in <laughs> to being the one without money and just being like, look, oh wait, your parents have a pool in the front yard? All right, where do you want to take me? Like, I think owning that, I mean, I think, I think it's good for people who do not have to recognize that like, it's not because we fucked up, mm -mm. right? Like, we're still fine. And I think it's important for us to do a service for our wealthier peers and let them know that, like, maybe you should come down to earth and pull up and pull this tab. Like, for sure. I, I, I would just say, get some broke friends. I mean, <laughs> why we? Because <Yeah. laughs> that's really your tribe right now. And you, and, and as you elevate, then the friends, and when you get more money, those friends will have more money. But you know, it, it's like, you know, she's friending up. <laughs> Fri 
friend down a little bit. <laughs> Too, you can like monetize that. Like, yeah. like, don't we love like the authentic and like the peasant street food? Be like, let me take you to this great place. It's called my auntie's house. How about you pay for groceries? Like, we can own this. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's go to the next question. I'm Mia. I'm 25 and in Baltimore. And I just moved to the city a few months ago to start my career. So I'm starting new in this city. And I'm wondering, how do you make friends as an adult? and find community, and why is it so hard? It's a lot harder than it was when I was in school, and I'm honestly feeling like a lost failure. So, thank you. Oh, Mia. She's so cute. Nisi, what's your advice for Mia? How do you build a community when you move to a new place? Well, you know, I would say go places that you like. It's always going to be somebody there, and not and don't be afraid to meet people. And a lot of times, you know, it starts where you are, where you spend the most time. That's where you're going to find the most people, the places that you spend the most time. Whether that's your work, your church, your school, your this, your that, you know. But in a closed mouth, won't get fed. You can even if you're at the gym or wherever, talk to people. And you'll be surprised, you know, the ones that don't talk back, because you know why? We attract a measure of what we are at any given moment. So the people who are right in lockstep with your energy will respond in kind. Mm -hmm. Is that getting harder with texting, with digital culture? Is it getting harder to talk? Shut up, my son, look, look here. My son, I watched him on the phone. I was on the computer working. He text messaged back and forth with the same girl for an hour and a half. And I said, son, pick up the phone and call the girl. He yeah. said, call her? <laughs> Don't nobody talk on the phone no more? I'm like, what is going yeah. on? It's so true. I could like find out I'm not into somebody just through their text conversation. At first I'm like, this is going well. And then like one weird emoji, I'm like, no, I'm never talking to him again. <laughs> it's like, it That's just crazy. open and shut. I know, it's not healthy. But I do find like, I remember like being in, you know, especially at work, sometimes I end up being in like a weird city by myself for like two months and I'll like go out, look at cool places or bars or shows. And, you know, just sitting there because I don't have anyone texting me, except my mother most of the time. And I'm like looking around like, Okay, and everyone is kind of like this. Like, I'm doing the motion looking down at my hand as if I'm on my phone. Um, So it's like everyone's kind of like lost in a world, and it is a little harder to just like, you know, make eye contact or smile at somebody. But it does take just like starting a silly conversation. Something happens, and you just comment on it and make it seem like your friend's in the bathroom so you're not like a weirdo. You're like, yeah, she's coming. Just hanging out. (laughs) Our next question is, is a recording. Hi everybody, my name is Jasmine and I'm 26. And my question is, you know, as someone in their mid 20s who's used to getting really good grades um, and using that to measure growth, I'm having a hard time feeling accomplished for things that don't typically come with sort of a pat on the back. It would be helpful to get some ideas on how to measure growth or how you did when you were my age. Nisi, I love you, bye. (laughs) I love you too. I think I, this is something I really struggled with when I was all of a sudden out of school is when you're used to getting kind of assignments, finishing assignments, getting told whether you did a good enough job and feeling like you're kind of on a track of growth. When that falls away in your 20s, if you felt like you had that, like how do you, how do you tell if you're whether keeping up, doing enough, growing enough? The one thing I will say is it always helps when you are honest with yourself. When you're honest with yourself, you know when you've done enough. You know when you've done your best. You know when you could have done more. Um, You know when you cheated yourself instead of treated yourself. Hmm. So I, 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 I say be honest with yourself. And if there's any place in your life that doesn't feel full for you, leaning into that direction. You know what I mean? You're like, okay, work, boom, check. But socially, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm missing something. Or in my intimate relationship, ah, this is, you know what I mean? So that you can have a little bit in all your cups. You know, the, the goal is to live full. You know what I mean? And then what happens is when you're getting the grades in school, that's somebody else judging you. 
You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You don't get to read your own paper and be like, yep, I'm going to write A on this. (laughs) (laughs) Right? So when you come out from underneath that, you're judging you. Now you're responsible for yourself and what you put into the world. You know when you go home and you did something and you're like, you know what, I shouldn't have did that. I I feel kind of guilty about that. That's you judging yourself, getting yourself in check. And I think that's where she has to rest. Definitely. And that's, it's a hard thing to have to, like, reappropriate that. But yeah. I also think something that's been helpful to me is, like, is a sense of competition, like healthy competition, and not being threatened by other people, whether it's another woman, whether it's a man, you know, whoever it is, and, and having it inspire you. And being like, you know what, I like the way they handled that situation. Or I like the way they did that. And be like, that's going to get me going. Um, because sometimes you can't find it in yourself and you have to see another representation of it. And don't feel threatened by it. Like, well, look, at they're doing their whole thing and I can't get it together. And I find that that's like, it's been, it's a new thing where I'm like, yeah, I feel competitive with this person, but it excites me because I think they're really awesome. And so I have to do that in my own way. And I think that helps me a lot. Using jealousy as a guide. That's yeah. one of my tricks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally. I think I end up taking it, like, to bring it, like, super literal. Um, as, a, as a former overachieving student, like, I was the kind of kid, like, if I wasn't going to be the first one to finish my test and make everybody else nervous, like somebody else went before me, I would hold on to my paper till the end of class. Because I didn't want anyone else to know that I wasn't the best. I was not okay. Um, and, like, I see that in some of my students now where they just, like, they need to know, they need this validation. And, like, if you're still in school, rubrics are a beautiful thing, and your instructors are supposed to have them. You can ask them what the metrics are for grading, and so even if you get a bad grade, you can understand the grade and, like, do better. But you can also do that for yourself in your world. So, like, if there's something you care about that you know you want to have that validation for, lay out a rubric for yourself what you think success would look like Do that before you go to do the thing. And then after you do it, you will have also laid out the things that success could look like when you define it. If you can see that, then you can move yourself towards not being so dependent on the fickle garbage people of the world. We have one last question from a listener who asked to be called Rebecca. She didn't want to use a real name. It's about sex. I'm a 20-something, and the life advice question that I have is about sex. Um... I'm wondering how to enjoy it. I think at this time in my life, it's awkward and it's weird. And my partner and I, we've been together for coming up on three years, but we both have really limited understandings of what we want and what we like and what we don't like. I don't know. I love other people's input and I hope to get some answers. Bye. Let me just start this off and say... Uh, Rebecca. (laughs) You ain't been in the world long enough to know what you want and what you like. It don't get good till you get grown. You got to learn your body. So right now, this is just practice. We just hanging out. We just trying to... We're talking about practice. We're just talking about... We're talking about practice. (laughs) And Michelle and I was in voice. That is exactly what we're talking about. Practice because it's not until you understand what you want in your body that you can articulate it to somebody else. You're looking at this little boy who ain't been around the block two, three times, and you're trying to think he's going to pleasure you in a way and he know what he's doing. He don't. (laughs) He don't. You know? And, And once you get older, don't hold nothing against a man who done had a lot of partners. He needed to get all that practice so he could serve you. Well, mm-hmm. so she just needs to take her time a little bit and not rush herself in it. You know what I mean? Not rush herself in it because it does get greater later. Mm. Ooh, that was good. The tagline, so good. Okay, how about, but give, but give me a sentence, someone, for like in the moment. What's the thing to say when you're trying to figure out how to make yourself feel good? What's the thing to say to your partner? While it's happening? Yeah. It? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I feel like from experience, it goes either way. Because sometimes you're like, you know what, I'm just going to tell them exactly what I want to do this. And sometimes you do like a certain voice to keep it in the mode. And then <laughs> sometimes I'll just be like, stop. You know, I'm like, let's turn the lights on and look at each other for a second. And we might not finish this tonight. But... <laughs> <laughs> 
I still feel like I have to tell you what I've been feeling lately and what I want to do, even though I've never done it, so I don't know what it's going to feel like. But it's so true what needs to be saying. It's like, I think there's something about expectations, especially when you're younger, that certain relationships, and especially sexual ones I had when I was younger, um, were so much expectation. It was like comparing it to the first time I had amazing sex with someone that I was in love with, and it was like so early on, and like we kissed in the rain, and I'm like, that happened once, and then I'm following it for another 10 years, like trying to get that back. You know, it's like, no. It, we can't have too many expectations, and I think it's also something for women um, that we're taught more that it's not just like, um, not that sex should necessarily be casual, but that it is an experience to learn from. And so next time you know this, and next time you set certain boundaries, or next time you ask for more, and in, instead of feeling like you're just supposed to get it, and I feel a lot of the time women just feel like, yeah, the, the partner is just supposed to do it, and we just kind of like slowly wave back and forth our bodies and hope it works out. <laughs> Well, I think, too, for, like, especially for young 20-somethings and for, for people who are raised as girl children, we are often, we, we forget how this, like, how the sexual economy works. So, I don't know, for me, like, it was always like, oh, like, dude wants to bone me? Thank you? Like, it didn't ever come into, like, maybe I might want something. It was just, like, this relief that I was desirable, that mm -hmm. someone who could want me. But, like... Anyone who wants to fuck you has already said that, like, you are worth something. They want you, and they are work willing to work for you. So you do have the right to say, like, this is the work I want you to put in. And if you don't know what that work is yet, then you have the right to say, like, actually, this isn't going well. Like, can I try a different dish on the menu? And also, too, you can't... Listen, it's, it's like rolling the dice, especially if it's a hookup. Mm -hmm. And you don't know that person, and they don't know you. So it's real, it, it, it's the random part of it. Anything could happen or not happen. But when you're in a relationship with somebody, the best time to talk about it is when you're not doing it. Yeah. Huh? Tell mama what you like. <laughs> oh, okay. That's when it, so that by the time you get there, we already got the roadmap laid out. And everybody knows their part. That's Nisi Nash, Alia Shawkat, and Terry Coleman. You can see Nisi Nash on Claws. Season one is out now. Alia Shawkat is the star of Search Party, a show on TBS. Season two is out November 19th, and you can binge season one on demand. And if you want to listen back to our original episode with Terry Coleman in New Orleans, there's a link on our website at deathsexmoney.org. Death, Sex, and Money is a listener-supported production of WNYC Studios in New York. I'm based at the Center for Investigative Reporting in Emeryville, California. Our team includes Katie Bishop, Annabelle Bacon, and Emily Botin. And thank you to the Work It Women's Podcast Festival and to their entire production team for hosting us. The Reverend John Delore and 